In the beginning, there was only chaos, the gaping emptiness of void. Then, with the passage of time, Starry Aranos and Gaia, heaven and earth, emerged from chaos. Gaia was the everlasting foundation of the gods of Olympus. She was followed by Tartarus, the great region beneath the earth, Eros, the shining god of love and attraction and desire and Erebus, the unknowable darkness where death dwells. From there, Gaia married Aranos, the starry sky, her equal, to cover her, the hills and the fruit-swelling oceans. Gaia then bore Orea, the mountains, and Pontus, the sea, without sweet union of love. Then she lay with Aranos and bore deep-swirling Oceanus, Coeus, and Creus, Hyperion, Iapetus, Thea, Rhea, Themis, and gold-crowned Phoebe, and lovely Tethys. After them was born Kronos, the willy, the youngest, and most terrible of her children. Only Kronos, the youngest of the Titans, was brave enough to take his mother's sickle and castrate his father. Kronos then became the king of the gods with his sister Rhea as his queen. Kronos, however, learned of a prophecy that he would be overthrown by one of his children. To prevent this, each time Rhea gave birth, Kronos swallowed the child. Rhea tricked Kronos when her sixth child Zeus was born. She wrapped in a stone swaddling clothes, which Kronos swallowed, thinking it was a baby. Zeus was then taken to Crete to be raised in secret. When Zeus grew up, he returned and forced Kronos to disgorge his siblings. He led them in war against Kronos and the Titans, and eventually they won, and Zeus became the king of the gods. And thus, the reign of the Olympians began, marking a new era in the history of the cosmos. Welcome back, fellow myth seekers and lovers of ancient wisdom. Today we embark on a captivating journey through the realms of God's creation and the epic clash of cosmic pantheons. Get ready to unlock the divine secrets as we delve into this mesmerizing world of Hesiod's Theogony and its enchanting connections to ancient Near Eastern theogonies and even the Old Testament book of Genesis. Hesiod's Theogony might be your go-to source for Greek mythology, but what if I told you that the deities of ancient Greece didn't work in isolation, but what if I told you that Genesis borrows its story from previous Genesis stories? Ever wondered how Greek gods like Zeus and Poseidon might rub elbows with the likes of Marduk and Tiamat? We'll be exploring the intriguing parallels between Babylonian and Hittite creation myths, Genesis, and Hesiod's Theogony. We'll also uncover the lingering influence of these ancient tales on later mythologies and religious beliefs. Hesiod's account of the Greek creation story as detailed in his work Theogony, begins with the emergence of chaos, void, or chasm. And from chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros came into existence, that is, Earth, Underworld, and Desire. Depending on which version we're looking at, either Gaia emerges with Aranos, or she gives birth to Aranos, who either way becomes her husband and the father of her children, the Titans. Kronos, the youngest of all, overthrows Aranos, castrates him, and then in turn is overthrown by his son, Zeus. And this is how we get the succession of the gods, which is called Theogony. Theogony, from the Greek Theogonia, 
meaning Generations of the Gods, is an epic poem of 1,022 hexameter lines which describe the birth of the gods in the Greek pantheon. It is thought to have been composed 700 BCE, or somewhere around the 8th century BCE. Little is known of Hesiod's life. His father emigrated from Chime in Asia Minor and settled in Boeotia, a small state in central Greece. It is assumed that the poet was a farmer, a fact garnered from the earlier verses of the Theogony. He may have also been a rhapsodist, a reciter of poetry, where he learned the technique and vocabulary of heroic songs. Although there are some who question whether or not Hesiod actually wrote the Theogony, most classicists believe he did. However, parts of the work may have been added by a later poet and there is a definite similarity in some aspects to some Mesopotamian literature. The Enuma Elish, also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation, is the Babylonian creation myth, whose title is derived from the opening lines of the piece, When on High. Enuma Elish. The myth tells the story of the great god Marduk's victory over the forces of chaos and his establishment of order at the creation of the world. All of the tablets containing the myth found at Ashur, Kish, Ashurbanipal's library at Nineveh, and other excavated sites date to 1200 BCE. Their colophons, however, indicate that these are all copies of a much older version of the myth dating from long before the reign of Hammurabi of Babylon, 18th century BCE, the king who elevated the god Marduk to patron deity of Babylon. The poem in its present form, with Marduk as champion, is thought to be a revision of an even older Sumerian work, and the Sumerian Ea or Enki or Enlil is thought to have played the major role in the original version of the story dated to 3500 BCE. Theogony of Dunu, composition that dates to the second millennium BCE, when Dunu was a town of importance. The text is useful for showing that each city may have had its own local traditions about creation, which differed even in essentials from those of other cities. Unlike the Epic of Creation or Enuma Elish, in which the primeval forces were seawater and freshwater, we have Plow and Earth as the originators of creation and the parents of the sea. Anu the sky, who creates the sky, which creates the earth. Thus, we cannot speak of Mesopotamian view of creation as a single specific tradition. This in turn shows the futility of claiming a direct connection between Genesis, as described in the Old Testament, and any one of the Mesopotamian account of creations. In fact, it mostly draws upon all of these theogonies that come before it. Hesiod's Theogony and the Enuma Elish are both ancient epic poems that explore the creation of the universe and the origins of the gods in different mythological traditions. While they come from different cultures and time periods, there are several similarities between the two works. Both Theogony and the Enuma Elish describe the process of creation and the establishment of order in the cosmos. They present elaborate cosmogenies that explain how the world came into existence and how the gods emerged. Both poems feature primordial deities who precede the main pantheon of gods. These primordial beings represent abstract concepts and forces of nature. In theogony, chaos or void is the initial entity from which everything else originates, while in the Enuma Elish, Tiamat, or the deep primeval sea, beginning of all. Both of these works provide genealogies of the gods, tracing their lineage and relationships. They present a hierarchy of gods and goddesses with different generations of deities and their interactions shaping the world in its divine order. Both poems depict conflicts among the gods that lead to the establishment of order in Theogony, 
the Titans rebel against Aranos, and then later Olympian gods overthrow the Titans. In the Enuma Elish, the younger gods, led by Marduk, battle against the primordial goddess Tiamat and her forces. Both poems address the succession of power among the gods. They portray a shift in leadership and authority from older generations to younger ones. In Theogony, Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods, while in Enuma Elish, it's Marduk. Both works employ common mythological motifs found in various cultures, such as the slaying of a monstrous deity for the creation of the world. These motifs reflect archetypal themes and symbolize the triumph of order over chaos. During the Bronze Age, this story was passed to the Hittites, who rendered the succession of the gods myth, or theogony, in several different stories that span from 1600 to 1200 BCE. The Kingship of Heaven and the Song of Kumarbi share some similarities with Hesiod's theogony in their portrayal of divine origins and establishment of order. Both Theogony and the Hittite creation myths present genealogies of the gods, tracing their lineage and relationships. They describe a hierarchy of deities and their interactions, the succession of power, and the emergence of a supreme god. Both traditions feature primordial deities who exist before the creation of the world. Just like Chaos and Gaia are among the initial entities, the Hittites have Alalu and Anu and Kumarbi who represent these primordial beings. While in Theogony, the Titans rebel, in the Hittite mythology, Kumarbi struggle against Anu, which eventually leads to the rise of the storm god Teshub. Both traditions address the theme of succession and power. Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods, while in Hittite mythology, Teshub becomes the chief deity after overcoming Kumarbi, who parallels Kronos. Teshub assumes the kingship in heaven. Both traditions describe how the gods shape the universe, assign roles and domains to different deities, and bring order from chaos. Hesiod's Theogony also has many parallels to the Egyptian creation myths etched on the walls of the city of Heliopolis, dated to around 2000 BCE, is a similar creation account that looks similar to Hesiod. And this Egyptian creation myth, the process of cosmic creation, they explain how the world came into existence and how order was established from chaos. This is the common thread through all of these creation stories that existed in this time period. While Chaos and Gaia are among these initial deities in Theogony, it's Atum or Amon and Nun who represent the primeval beings in the Egyptian creation account that's etched in the walls of Heliopolis. In Theogony, Hesiod describes how the gods, through their words, bring about the birth and organization of the cosmos. Similarly, in the Egyptian creation myths, the universe is believed to have been spoken into existence by the gods through their words or thoughts. Both narratives highlight the active involvement of gods in the creation of the world. They portray gods as creators, shapers, and organizers of the cosmos. Both Theogony and the Egyptian Genesis depict the transformation of chaos into order. They present the gods' efforts to establish stability and harmony in the universe or mat, as the Egyptians call it, organizing elements and assigning roles to different deities. Another theogony from the ancient world known as the Phoenician history, attributed to a Bronze Age priest named Sanko Niathan from Beirut. And like Hesiod's theogony, it describes a hierarchy of deities and their interactions highlighting the succession of power and the emergence of the supreme god. Both traditions feature primordial deities who exist before the creation of the world. Like Chaos, Gaia, and Aranos, the Phoenician creation myth includes El, the Semitic word for God, 
which is also the same word used in the Hebrew Bible for the one true God, along with other titles like the yod he vav he and Adonai. Both narratives depict the conflicts and struggles among the gods that shape the world and establish order. In Theogony, the Titans rebel against Aranos, and the later Olympians battle against the Titans. In the Phoenician myth, El and his offspring battle against the primordial gods that came before him. El sacrifices his firstborn, only begotten son, Yahud, as an offering to Aranos, his father in heaven, and then circumcises himself and makes this a custom among the Phoenicians from that day forward. It is believed that this story is retold in the Old Testament book of Genesis, with Abraham offering his son Isaac as an offering to El, the same name, but is stopped by an angel. And like the Phoenician myth, Abraham also circumcises himself and makes this a custom among the Hebrews. Both Hesiod and Sanko Nathan tradition address the theme of succession and divine power. They portray a transfer of authority from the older generations to the younger ones. In Theogony, Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods. In the Phoenician myth, El is succeeded by his other son, Dagon, who then becomes the chief ruler of the Phoenicians. And like the other myths that came afterwards, the Phoenician cosmology in Theogony describes how the gods shape the universe and bring order from chaos. Phoricides of Syros, pre-Socratic Ionian philosopher, in the 6th century BCE was said to have received a cosmological creation story from the Phoenicians who he studied under. This particular rendering of the Phoenician creation seems to be slightly different from what Sanko Neathan laid down and was attributed to the legendary Pelasgians who inhabited the Aegean long before the Greeks and Mycenaeans. Like Hesiod's Theogony that presents genealogical accounts of the gods and tracing their lineage and relationships. It describes a succession of deities, often in a hierarchical structure. Both traditions feature primordial deities who exist before the creation of the world. In Theogony, it's Chaos and Aranos and Gaia among the three initial entities. While in the Fragments of Phoricides, it's Kronos, Zas, and Cthoni. Both narratives touch upon conflicts among the gods that shape the world and establish order. In Theogony, the Titans rebel against Aranos, and later the Olympians against the Titans. In Phoricides' Theogony, there are references to struggles among the gods, Zas overthrowing Kronos, and Kronos overthrowing Ophion. Both traditions address the theme of succession in power. They portray a transfer of authority from the older generations to the younger ones, Zeus emerges as the supreme ruler of the gods. The Derveni Papyrus is an ancient Greek manuscript that was discovered in 1962 during excavations in Derveni, a suburb of Thessaloniki in Greece. It is considered one of the most important archaeological finds relating to ancient Greek religious and philosophical beliefs, believed to date back to the 4th century BCE and is the oldest surviving text and physical copy in Europe in world history. The papyrus contains a philosophical treatise written in Greek addressing various cosmological and religious topics. It discusses the nature of the gods, the origins of the universe, the role of sacrifices and rituals, and the interpretation of religious texts and myths. One of the notable aspects of the Dervani Papyrus is its commentary on an earlier poem attributed to Orpheus, a legendary figure in ancient Greek mythology, a son of Apollo and the high priest of Dionysus, said to be the teacher of a man named Musaeus, who later historians say 
is possibly Moses. He was called Orpheus the Theologian, the Revealer of the Heavens. Commentary provides an allegorical interpretation of this poem, discussing its cosmogenic and theogenic themes. The Derveni Papyrus is significant because it provides valuable insights into the religious and philosophical beliefs of ancient Greeks during the late classical period. It offers a glimpse into the ways in which ancient Greeks interpreted their myths and religious practices, and it sheds light on the development of philosophical and cosmological thought. Both texts delve into cosmological concepts, seeking to explain the origins of the universe and the nature of the gods. They explore the relationship between the divine, the natural world, and human existence. Both texts contain theogonic narratives describing the genealogies and relationships of the gods. They present accounts of the succession of divine powers and the establishment of cosmic order. Both texts engage in the interpretation of the myths, seeking deeper meaning and symbolism. Hesiod's theogony provided a foundation for later philosophical and cosmological inquiries. The Dravani Papyrus, with its philosophical treaties and allegorical interpretation, reflects the philosophical interests of the time. Everything that's mentioned in this video so far has references older than the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. There is no reference to the book of Genesis by anyone in any primary sources before the 4th century BCE. And this leads us to the final installment of creation stories that are similar to Hesiod's Theogony, which is the book of Genesis in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. Both Theogony and Genesis address the process of creation and the establishment of the world. They present accounts of how the universe came into existence and how order was established. They both begin with an eternal being, either chaos or Elohim, and then heaven and earth are immediately created. The Greek Septuagint, which was produced in Alexandria, Egypt, around 270 BCE, uses Gaia and Aranos for heaven and earth, and in the Greek text, the similarities are staring you in the face. They both begin with darkness, or Nyx, before light, or in the case of Hesiod, Erebus gave birth to Ether and Day. In both accounts, they move from heaven and earth to darkness and light, and then to the separating two waters, which in the case of the Theogony is the Raging Sea and Oceanus. They both seem to have double accounts of how this happens. They both end up with the creation of humankind, but in the case of Hesiod's Theogony, the birth of Aphrodite seems to parallel Eve. Instead of Adam's rib being used to create Eve, the genitalia of the castrated Aranos falls into the sea and white foam formed which Aphrodite was sprang from. Pandora and Eve show obvious parallels too. Pandora's box being opened has parallels to Eve biting the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In both cases, the woman is the reason for the problems of the world. What's even apparent is that Hesiod even mentions good and evil in this very passage. Whoever marries as fated and gets a good wife, compatible, has a life that is balanced between good and evil, a constant struggle. But if he marries the abusive kind, he lives with pain in his heart all down the line. Prometheus, who creates mortal humans, seems to parallel Adam and Cain in one character as he is the primordial god who humans descend from, but also, like Cain, gives offerings to Zeus that are rejected. The son of Prometheus, Deucalion, has to build an ark and survive a flood that is levied by Zeus. Both texts present a hierarchy, structure of divine beings. They describe a succession of gods and their relationships. In the case of the Old Testament, the succession of the patriarchs from Adam to Noah to Abraham to Moses and down, highlighting the order and organization within the divine realm and the earthly realm. The gods are assigned specific roles and dominions over different aspects of the universe and theogony, just like the patriarchs are in Genesis. Both traditions feature primordial beings 
who exists before the creation of the world. Chaos is existing before anything in Theogony, while God is depicted as pre-existing before the creation of the world. In Theogony, the gods bring about the birth and organization of the cosmos through their words. Similarly, in Genesis, God creates the world by speaking it into existence with his divine command. Divine creation from the order from chaos. Both traditions present the idea of the world being brought out of chaos into order. They describe the transformation of formless and void conditions into a structured and organized universe. The process of creation involves the establishment of boundaries and the separation of the elements. They present accounts of how humans were created by divine entities and their relationship with the divine. The Epic of Creation, a Mesopotamian text cited by Barosus the Chaldean in the 3rd century of the BCE. The text itself dates to the 2nd millennium BCE, and this text has seven tablets, just like the seven days of creation. In the first tablet, heaven and earth emerge. The second tablet, in the atmosphere and firmament are created, just like the second day of creation in Genesis. It is the fourth tablet where the constellations, the sun, moon, and stars are created, just like day four in Genesis. The fifth tablet, birds and sea creatures are created, just like day five of Genesis. Lastly, day six in Genesis is when humans are created, and in the same way, tablet six, we have humans created. And the most striking parallel of all, on the seventh tablet, the gods rest, just as in day seven, the one true God rests. The Agony of Dunu, which dates to the early 2nd millennium BCE. And this text reads, At the very beginning, Plow married Earth, and they decided to establish a family and dominion. We shall break up the virgin soil of the land into clods. In the clods of their virgin soil, they created the sea. Plow is a constellation in the sky that represents the heavens. So, once again, we have heaven and earth getting married, creating the world and separating the seas. And that, my fellow myth travelers, brings us to the end of our captivating journey. Through the tangled web of divine connections, from the depths of chaos to the heights of Mount Olympus, we've unraveled the secrets that bind Hesiod's Theogony with the ancient Near Eastern Theogonies. As we close this chapter, let us marvel at the enduring power of these ancient myths. They transcend time and culture, reminding us of our shared human quest for understanding and meaning. In the interwoven tapestry of myths, we find echoes of our collective imagination and the universal questions that have accompanied humanity since time began. The gods may have different names and faces, but their stories connect us across boundaries and generations to the gods and goddesses who inspire us, to the ancient scribes who preserve these tales, and to you, dear Gnosis seekers, for joining me on this incredible journey. Cheers to the power of myth and the wonders it unveils. Stay tuned for more mythological adventures coming your way. And I'll leave in the comments what you would like me to cover in the next couple videos. Also, you have just attained true gnosis.